there, I'm Natalie. And I'm Max. And we're cruising Israel for ILTV. Today, Max, we're gonna visit the most hardworking cows in the game. Cows? Hardworking cows? <laughs> yes. So, um, have you ever milked a cow before? Me? Never. I've never been up close and personal with a cow, but... Me either, and it looks like you're gonna be maybe milking a cow today, huh? <laughs> I guess we'll see. Let's check it out. Israel has the largest selection of different types of cheeses. We're here up in the Golan in Kurlander Farm, who's been in the dairy industry since 1951. Let's go check it out. If your bucket list involves feeding a baby calf, then you're in luck. At Kurlander Farm, you can experience the day in the life of a cow while petting, feeding, and learning all about the cows and milk production. They sleep on the straw, and they eat it too. Who wants, who wants some water? Hey, don't be selfish. You got some food in your mouth. He's thirsty. Very thirsty. Not so. Wow, I've never gotten so close to a cow. <laughs> what? Why is he doing this? It's like a pacifier. After treating my fingers like a chew toy, it was time to learn about the calves. These calves are the the newest. These two were born, this one was born yesterday, this was two days yesterday. before. Yesterday? Yesterday, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. And, it's a uh, baby. Yeah, it's a baby and you can see it's... Uh, it's pretty big for a day-year-old. Yeah, it's not like, uh, like a human baby. It's like after 15 minutes or so, it's already walking around. Yeah. How heavy are they when they're born? Around 100 pounds, something like that. You can see the cord, the umbilical yeah. cord. Mm -hmm. It's now it's not, not, not completely dry and still hasn't fallen. What do these calves need? How long are they in these individual cages for? So, so th this is like nursery, or, or like, I don't know, even, even before. Yeah. And they're, they're gonna be here for like a few weeks only because we wanna, we wanna bottle feed them and we wanna, nurse, we wanna nurse them and we wanna take care of them. They're quite, uh, well, delicate in this That's time of their life. Everyone. After they finished here, they're gonna be here for a few more weeks, starting on, uh, on solid food. Then we're gonna take them to the other farm until they are ready to be to be cows, we call it. Are there baby calves here all year round? Yeah, sometimes we have more births, uh, but according to the planning, because we want to have more milk in the, in the, in the summer when, we get the, when the price is higher. Uh, so it changed a little bit, but, but we, have, uh, we, have, we have them all, the, all the year price, round. The price of milk is higher in the summer? In the summer, because, because it's harder to make milk in the summer. Cows, they don't like the heat. During the, during the summer, we have to take them to the shower a few times oh, wow. a day. Because of Israel's difficult climate, the cows must receive loads of attention so they can efficiently produce milk. And because of Israeli developed systems which have been implemented in the farm, including housing structures and cooling systems, the cows achieve much higher production than ever before. I thought cows were supposed to be lazy. This one is running around in its own little... Let's feed him. Let's feed the little guy. Hi! Eat food! Okay, he doesn't want. All right, let's go check out the adult cows. This is the restaurant. This is where the cow eats. It's like a very good hotel. There's a buffet all day long, open buffet. They come and eat whenever they like. Wow, look at the we size have, of these cows. We have a sunroof, like in the car. You see, we open it for the sun. It's electric. And you can see the cows are pretty big. How old are these cows? These ones are the older cows. This one, let's say, this one is, should be like six or seven. They're lying around, chewing their cup, very happy in the sun. We open the roof for them. You see that the manure is very dry, we keep it very dry. So this cow looks like he's ready to be milked, no? They are before their, uh, their milking session, but uh, well, they look like this all the time. So I've milked a goat before on the show, but never a cow. So it's your lucky day. <laughs> it's my lucky day. See, the tail is very nice, and it's, I'm the hairdresser, and uh, Petty Manny, that's me. Really? Yeah, with the disc. Mm -hmm. So all the cows here are pregnant. These ones are around eight months to their pregnancy. Oh, wow. Over there is nine months, really ready. <laughs> so this is our milking parlor. This is where we milk our cows three times a day. They come in here. Every cow's got a special identification tag on her leg. There's an antenna here, the computer gets all the information. 
This thing is also a pedometer that counts the steps. So we know when the cow's in heat, wants to get pregnant, or when she's about to deliver. All goes directly to my phone. Wow, yeah. high tech farmer. Of course. When the cows are brought to the milking room, the first step is to put a soapy substance on the cow's udder. A small amount of milk is then squeezed just for a visual check, and if everything looks okay, they attach the milking cluster where the milk flows directly to the tank, where it is maintained at a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius. So every cow here gives around 10 gallons. That's the number one in the world. Now that we know how the cluster works, I think it's time to give it a try. So, now you need to do it. From ah. top to bottom and open it. Squeeze time. it down. Yeah, like this. <laughs> so what we always do here, if we like someone, is <laughs> this. That was not fair. <laughs> Look at that. All over me. Look at this. <laughs> Doesn't get any fresher than that. You're third generation dairy farm owners. You started out with one cow and now you have how many? Around 500. How did this happen? <laughs> well, throughout the, throughout the years, this, uh, the cow that was pregnant uh -huh. delivered, gave birth, and then they bought some more cows and uh, it grew, making two million liters of milk wow. each year. And where do you sell them? It goes to Tnuva, most of it. So Tnuva is the biggest uh, dairy company in Israel. Mm -hmm. Used to be like a co-op. Of, of, the, of the kibbutzim and moshavim. So these are all Israeli cows? They're all from here? They're all from here. It's years of years of, of breeding, of planning, of you know, genetic planning, and artificial inseminations. Oh, wow. That's the Katusha rocket from uh, the Second Lebanon War. And it landed here, it landed, in the farm? It landed next to our truck, coming back from the packing house, not so far from here. It's like kind of washed you know, across, wow. and landed just next to it. Nice piece of decoration here. Yeah, and I, I also I always tell everyone here that since 51, we never missed a single milking session with all the wars. Now that's dedication. The milk that doesn't go to the factory is pasteurized right here in Curlander Farm. They produce many different kinds of cheeses, from spreadable to harder ones. So now it's time for a little cheese tasting over here. We have an assortment of different type of cheeses that's made right here. Why don't you tell us about each one? So, uh, starting from Labane, which is very, very Israeli, very popular. Very popular. It's uh, the Arabs and the Druze here in this area. This is their cheese. Mm -hmm. And uh, we make it here, of course, from our milk. Soft white cheese with uh, peppers. And that's fatit, what we call it in Israel. It's kind of semi-hard cheese. This one's with uh, dried tomatoes, and this one is white. Bel paese, Italian kind of hard cheese, creamy inside. And of course, the camembert, just out of the uh, incubation. This is actually it's my favorite type of cheese. <laughs> good, good choice. So let's try it. Let's try. So you practically work here all your life. I hope you don't eat too much cheese. <laughs> Because if I worked here, I'd be eating this all day. Better. Let's mix them all together. <laughs> That's delicious. It's good creamy texture. So, you produce your own olive oil as well here? Yeah, yeah. This one is uh, the Barnea variety. That's my grandma in the picture. Oh. And it's organic, first cold pressed, USDA, organic approved olive oil. So, it works. Excellent with all the cheese. Yeah, as well together. Soaked. Mm. Besides for being a dairy farm, Curlander Farm also grows organic citrus fruits. This one is, a, is an Israeli kind of hybrid and it's very sweet and it's called Odem, which is red or rouge mm -hmm. because of the color. Yeah. And it's very tasty. Really, this is like the sweetest tangerine I've tried. So you only grow citrus fruits here? Not only, we have citrus fruits and we also have uh, plums, apricot, peaches, uh, all the summer fruits. Mm -hmm. So with loads of activities to do in the Upper Galilee, Curlander Farm is definitely worth the trip. <laughs> that was a cool experience, Max. Yeah, who knew there were so many cows up here in yeah. Angola? So for our next uh, thing up here, there's another farm. Mm -hmm. They do, uh, they make some wine and some other things. 
And they do it all with a kind of a biblical mm. tradition. Now, I don't know all the details, but I'm sure that they'd be happy okay. to teach us all I that. I trust you, Max. All right, let's go. Let's go. There are many unique things to do here in the north of Israel, and today we're going to meet a lovely couple that combines the philosophy of ecological living and a fun tour. So let's check it out. We're now here on the ecological farm, which was entirely built on recycled material by Tommy and her husband, Bobby, 16 years ago. So tell us what you have to offer here on the farm. We start with the way that people were living here in the Golan Heights mm -hmm. thousands of years ago, in the Bible time. Mm -hmm. And then we go to the new, and we see our winery, our restaurant with our cheese, our olive oil that we made for all people that come to us. But what's going on behind us? What's Bobby doing? Bobby is uh, preparing the vineyard for the new grapes that will start in two months. In order to understand modern methods, first we must go back thousands of years to the time of our ancient ancestors. Come in to the wine press. In Hebrew it's called gut. You know what people do in here? They love it so much. They take baskets, go to the vineyards when the grapes are ready, pick up the grapes, put it here on the floor, wash their feet there, and press it. Start stomping. Stomping on grapes was an integral part of winemaking history, and extracting the juice by simply using body weight prevents the pits from being crushed along with the grape, thus making sweet wine. When they press the grapes there, all the juice comes down from this pipe, and they collect it with the bottle, all the juice come in. Well, now that we've seen how wine is made in ancient times, why don't we check out the, how olive oil is made? Come and see. So here we have the black olives that Bobby just picked up off the tree. And how do you start? You Crush. take the stone mm -hmm. and smash it on the rock. Notice how, how much oil we have in it, like this. Try to squeeze it. You, mm -hmm. but listen, a lot of oil there is here, but the oil doesn't come out. To take it out, we use water. So the oil come up and we collect it and we put it in the amphora because all the dirty material come to these corners and stay there. The Mediterranean olive tree and its oil symbolize the connection the Jews have with the land and its 2,000 year old history. The oil was the most imperative agricultural product and was used for food, light, heat, cosmetics, and let's not forget its use in religious rituals. Olive oil made from these two hands. <laughs> Do you want to see how they make their own flour? Let's go to the millstone. This is a millstone, okay? In Hebrew, we call it Evan Rechaim. You must grind it. Okay. Try to do it. Feel how difficult work is it. Wow. And it's not smooth. That's why yes. it's even harder. They didn't eat meat a lot because people was known their status by how many animals they had. If they will eat it, no, no status to show. After the grain is crushed into flour and blended with other raw materials from the garden, it is baked in a clay oven, all made from the bare hands of Tommy and Bobby. The clay was collected from the Sea of Galilee. At Belofri Farm, they complete the biblical menu. Here is where everything we've seen today comes together. The Belofri Farms believes in a central value that honors the traditional study in the Bible. Why don't you continue on and explain all the different ceramic arts that you've created here. In the Bible it was written that when you collect your wheat, your grape, and your olives, mm -hmm. when God will give us this, when we be kind to the other. The fate of the seven varieties mentioned in the Bible, the most important being wheat, barley, grapes, and olives, is determined in the period between the holidays of Passover and Shavuot. Do you remember that we grind the, the wheat? This is a way to do it. Here, we take care of the grape, how we press it in the wine press. And here is how we make from our oil, olives the olive oil. The settlement of En Nashut in the Golan is where the tradition of winemaking all began. And it is where Tommy and Bobby collect the grapes. It then continues to age in their very own wine cellar, which used to be a Syrian army bunker. We're making 15,000 bottles a year, mm -hmm. but this is a family wine cellar. Here we sit all the wines that we collect each year, we put it here. Let's taste some wine. We make different kinds of wine. More yes, sweet, we make more Cabernet Sauvignon, mm. Merlot, Syrah, Petit Verdot, and Shiraz. 
The wine is unoaked and made without sulfites. We call our winery En Neshot Winery. This is the name of ancient Jewish village that was here across the world 1,500 years ago. We are sitting on its land and what between us? They made a lot of wine on this land and we came 1,500 years ago after mm -hmm. and make a lot of wine. As we can see, it's never a dull day for Tommy and Bobby. They continuously make new works of art that they showcase here in their gallery or around the farm. Here we could see Tommy made bowls and plates that they serve in their restaurant from scratch. Behind us, we have the restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was built like the farmer thousands of years ago built his house. He was looking for, for material, maybe clay to put on your roof, or maybe walk to build the house, or wood to build, to build any furniture. Today we call it recycling. All the restaurant was built with a recycled material. Natalie, wine is not enough. Are you <laughs> hungry? I'm starving. So let's go to the restaurant. Let's try the food. Remember, we want to recycle the menu mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, or the Bible time. So all what we have here, it's dairy with cheese mm -hmm. and vegetables. Let's see. We have here bread. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who want the ultimate biblical experience with the best tour guides around, this one-of-a-kind farm is a must. Max, what do you think about Italian food? For the show? Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty good, but usually it's not kosher. No, this one's actually kosher in Tel Aviv, and it's Italian. Well, but we are a two-hour drive away. We're up in the Golan, so I hope you're not that hungry. I think I can make it. It's as good as you say. It is. Cool. Let's go. Israel's most modern city is booming with culturally diverse restaurants. But which kitchen is all about freshness, simplicity, and has an abundance of flavors? Italian, of course. Here at Restaurant Uno, we're about to indulge in the flavors of Italy. Let's go. For lovers of fine dining and traditional Italian cooking, Restaurant Uno offers just that. From the food to the drink menu, there is much to choose from. Hmm, what to order, what to order? Such a rich menu, it's kind of hard to decide. You know what? Let's head to the kitchen and see what the chef has to say. The appetizers are my favorite place in the, in the restaurant. Here we have arancini. It's a risotto balls with the tomato sauce. And this is uh, malfetti, spinach. Spinach, spinach balls? Spinach balls. Wow, nothing is better than the smell of freshly baked bread. And this is dangerous, my friends. I thought they needed some help in the kitchen, so I went in. Italian restaurants only serve the freshest pastas. So? Order's up! <laughs> <laughs> Time to get serious and to learn a little something from the head chef. Here at Uno's kitchen, there are five different sections. It's a pretty large kitchen. Behind me, they're making pizza. Over here is the dessert section, the salads, the fish, and the pasta. Head chef Benny Ashkenazi, and today he's going to make a porcini gnocchi with chestnuts. Right? Yeah, it's okay. okay, so what's the first thing we have to do to make this? Dish? Butter and butter. Uh, garlic. Butter, garlic. Mushroom. Chestnuts. Yeah, okay. The Italian kitchen loves many flavors. They like having five different ingredients on each of the plate, their plates. Ooh, 
sprinkling on some Parmigiano. That was quick and easy. Mm, cheese. Love it. Good job. So okay. now how long does the pizza go into the oven for? Uh, four minutes. Four minutes? With all the good food here at Uno, it's important to save room for dessert. We're now in the dessert section where all the delicious treats are. I see some chocolate, some peanuts. Uh, what is this? Uh, caramel. Uh, caramel balloon. Uh, Salty caramel. Mm, interesting. Looks like hummus to me. <laughs> oh man. Mascarpone. Okay, that's enough preparing. Now it's time to go eat. Now we are going to drink Israeli wine. We have a large selection of Israeli wine, only Israeli kosher wines. That's our way of thinking. Okay, let's cheers. Cheers. Do you import any of your ingredients from Italy? Yes, the, the basic ones are from Italy all the pasta, spaghetti, the tomatoes, the flour, mm -hmm. the mushrooms, the balsamic vinegar. It's all from Italy. All from Italy. Wow, sounds good. Let's take a peek. Kosher ones. Would you say that Israeli and Italian culture are similar? The, they have things in common. We are in yeah. the Mediterranean. I think so. And uh, we love bread, and they love bread. We love everything with tomatoes, flour. Tomatoes, they tomatoes love tomatoes. Tomatoes also. Wow, this is good pizza. Yeah, so it's Very spinach. good. I like the <coughs> topping of the goat cheese. And the main thing, this gnocchi is homemade here. We made them fresh oh, yeah. every day from potatoes. Wow. And we roll it, we cut it. You have hot chocolate, mm. chocolate, caramel ice cream with salt, mm -hmm. nuts, and the brownies. I love the combination of the nuts, salt, sweet, chocolatey. This is a great dessert to end mm -hmm. a, a nice meal, a nice Italian meal. don't like wine, we have great cocktails and also Italian beer. Oh yeah? Yes. Let's go see how you make the okay. cocktails. Let's go. What are you going to make for us today? A cocktail uh, called Romeo. Uh, it's based on whiskey. Oh, okay. It's a little bit sweet and sour. Okay? So we'll take a shaker. Okay. And some, uh, do some crushed ice. One shot of whiskey. And a little bit of white sugar. Take sour. Lime juice. And we finish uh, with the cherry liquor. Cherry liquor. and you can enjoy the cocktail. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a strong, it's a strong cocktail. Yeah. Strong lady. <laughs> strong lady, strong cocktail for a strong lady. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> So with the combination of rich flavors and a romantic setting, makes for a fun dining experience right here in the heart of the culinary capital. Well, that's all the time they gave us today, but thanks for watching. Don't forget to watch Max and I every week as we cruise Israel. Bye-bye.